straight to uh, to you from us. Are you ready to pray with us? <laughs> Are you ready to declare your position in the house of the Lord? Okay, let's do this now. Come on, put your hands together. Like this. Sacrifice. 
out to you. Come on, wherever you are, just commune with your father right now. Commune with your father right now. Together we say, Father, here I am once again, in wonder and awe, amazement. So grateful for all that you do. Surrender to
identity, O oh God. We release it to you right now, our Father. And we ask that you will take it and use it to your glory, O oh God. Yes, to the glory of your name, our Father. Continue to stare us, O oh God, to seek after you, to watch for you, to look for you, Lord God, in spaces where you can be found. O oh God, right now we release control unto you. And we ask that you will take charge of our lives, our Father. Take charge, O oh God, and make us into that which you have created us to be. For in Jesus' name we have worship. And all God's people say a big Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together Amen. wherever Amen. you are for the King of Kings Amen. and the Lord of Lords. For he's worthy Amen. of all our Amen. praise. Yes. May the Lord God bless you. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome to Mavuno Church and Mavuno Church Online. What an incredible joy and privilege to have you joining us from wherever you are today. Welcome to the home of the fearless. If you're watching from your home, your living room, you've got people with you, wherever you're watching from, what a great joy it is to have you. I know we have viewing centers, people watching from different places together with others in Indiani, in Langata, in Kilimani, and all across the world. If you're in one of our viewing centers, oh man, we are so excited that you are there and that you are watching and following along. Great to have you with us. We have this every Sunday morning uh, right here on this platform. But in addition to that, we've got different things that happen during the week. One of them is that every Wednesday we gather as God's people for what we call family night, a time of teaching and instruction. That's 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. every single Wednesday evening, East African time. And you're welcome to come, come with your discipleship group, come with your friends, come with your workmates. It's a wonderful time. It's virtual and the uh, information is up on your screen. In addition to that, we also have morning prayers every single weekday morning. And let me tell you, there's nothing that says faith building. There's nothing that helps you grow your spiritual muscles like getting up early in the morning. So we pray 4.30 to 5.30 a.m. every single weekday, Monday to Friday, East African time. I want to invite you as well. The details and the links will be up on your screen so you're able to kind of take a picture of that. Just note it down and make sure that you're there for that. We want to take a moment right now and just celebrate the Lord and honor Him even with our giving. I'll tell you one thing that I've come to learn in my life. There is nothing, there's hardly, hardly anything that shows the state of my heart, like my resources and where my resources go. They have an incredible way of showing me what's important to me, what matters to me and what doesn't matter to me. Because let's be honest, who spends on stuff that doesn't matter to them? We all spend on the things that are important and are critical for us. And here's a verse. I'm sure we've read this before. It's in Matthew chapter 6 and it says this. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where, neither th where, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then listen to how it ends. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, your heart always follows. And nothing reveals your heart. And this is part of the reason why for me, giving, giving of my tithes, my offerings, and my first fruits is critical for me because it shows that in my heart that I am surrendered and completely committed to the Lord Almighty. So as we give today, the details will be up on the screen so you're able to give by the different, uh, different methods. But allow me just to say a quick prayer over us even as we do that and to prepare our hearts for God's word in just a moment. So Father, we thank you for this incredible opportunity you give us as God's people to gather even virtually around the world to sit still and to listen to the word of God. Thank you that you give us the opportunity as well to honor you and to celebrate you with our giving, with our tithes, with our offerings and with our first fruits. As we give them today, oh God, I pray the Lord you would bless them for the expansion of your kingdom and for the growth of the church as well. So we thank you for this, oh Lord. I pray for everyone who's giving today, the Lord, you would look upon them with grace, with grace and with kindness, oh Lord, and the Lord, you would reward them. And even for those, oh God, who are saying, I, I'm giving out of the lack, I'm giving out of lack, I pray for them. The Lord, you would look upon them favorably as well. And the Lord, you would, you would change their situations and circumstances, oh Lord. 
But nonetheless, we bring all our gifts, all our offerings before you and we say, Lord, here they are. We surrender them to you as our offering from our heart. We bless you and we honor you. We look forward to, to engaging with you and hearing your word. Open up our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears so we can hear you today. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people at home then say, Amen. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it is, wherever you are. It's really good to see you. Good to have you joining us at Mavuno Church Online, the home of the fearless. It's another week in October and great to have you here. My name, if you don't know, is David Korea. I'm one of the pastors here at Mavuno Church. I pastor the church out in Lavington, Mavuno Church, Lavington. And I always feel so honored and privileged to be here and the opportunity to share God's word with you is just an incredible, incredible, incredible one. So I'm looking forward to it as we get into week three of this series that we've been doing all through the month of October. But before I get into, into it too much, I want to ask you a question. It's a simple question for you. And my question is this, at the end of a long, hard day or a long, hard week, what is one thing that you enjoy doing that makes you happy? At the end of a long day or week, what's the one thing that you enjoy doing that makes you happy? As you think about that, I asked some of my friends what some of the things that make them happy are. One person said, sleeping, just leave me alone to sleep. Some people just like quiet time all by themselves. Some said watching a movie, having a good meal or a good drink, listening to music, attending a gig. All these things are stuff that makes people happy. Can I tell you about mine? Mine is playing a sport and I love to play basketball. That's the one thing that I really enjoy doing. Ever since I was in standard four, the sound of a basketball bouncing, it just gives me an incredible, incredible rush until today, it's irresistible for me. And even if I was to deliver this message and hear a basketball bouncing, same thing even today. You know, at one time I thought I would play the sport professionally, but everyone in my life felt like I have a rugby physique and a body bodybuilder's physique and they just felt, maybe this is not for you. So I understand where they are coming from, but basketball is the thing that makes me happy. And you know what? Each of us has that thing that brings us great happiness. It could be the flicker of a new relationship or going out on a first date, receiving flowers, that's one that makes my wife happy. Receiving flowers or biting into a delicious chocolate cake with a side of vanilla ice cream. Mm, That's it, isn't it? Or it could be more serious. It could be the, the contentment that comes from accomplishing a life goal or ticking something off your bucket list. We all crave for feelings of happiness and delight in our world, don't we? Now, we all realize it, but we all live our lives with this thing we call the pursuit of happiness. We get into relationships because we know that they're going to make us happy. Our aspirations are driven by the single idea that accomplishing a certain goal will give us happiness. And the moment we realize that these things don't bring the happiness that we expected they would, what do we do? We move on. We move on to something or someone else. Surely, if something, think about it, if something is not bringing you joy in your life, why are you allowing it airtime in your life, Allah? Why? And if there's a situation in your life that's not bringing the bliss that you desire, you crave, you, you need, what choice is there? You exit, isn't it? You exit and you move on. In fact, our mantra In our generation, one of our mantras has become encapsulated in this phrase, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy. And you know what? It sounds completely reasonable. Why would you do things that don't make you happy, that bring you unhappiness? Why? Why? Ask someone next to you, why? Why? As far as it is in your control, pursue happiness. Seek a thing we call good vibes. In fact, we say good vibes only. That's what we want, good vibes only. Even in our journey of faith, we conclude that, you know what? See, God is good. God is good. He's a good God. That means God must only want happiness for me. That's the only thing that God wants for me. Why would he want bad things for me? And we say, God just wants me to be happy. It makes sense. And these phrases and these ideologies get extrapolated across our lives. In our friendships, you may have heard someone say, This person, they're not bringing me good vibes. They're not bringing me positive energy in my life. I'm not sure I want to be around them. 
Or maybe you've had the more prevalent one. It's time to cut out toxic people from my life. Now, if you're there and you've never heard that phrase, you're wondering, Allah, people say that. Maybe you're the toxic person. Maybe you've been cut from someone's life and you, you don't even know it. Now, in our workplaces as well, we say to ourselves, why work in a place that's not bringing you good vibes? Why? Leave. That's the, the best thing that you can do. In relationships and in marriage, you say, if this guy is not making me happy, exit. In fact, it's interesting, a word that has become so prevalent in our society these days as we describe people is narcissistic. That person is narcissistic. They are narcissists. Leave them. Now, I need to be cautious here because I know that there are situations in life that demand for you to exit. Spaces where harm is, in, is imminent or abuse of one kind is likely. It could be in the workplace where you are being forced to compromise your convictions then there you can exit. A relationship where your life is at risk, you must run for the hills. But guys, I have a greater point here. And my point is this, is that we've slowly become a people whose pursuit of personal happiness trumps everything. We live our lives with one hand on the steering wheel of life and one hand on the eject button. Why? Because we're on this pursuit of good vibes only. Now, for our visitors, we've been going through this series throughout the month of October called Two Truths and a Lie. And through this series, we look at different catchphrases and ideologies that have captured the imagination of our generation, stuff that pop culture keeps telling us and has entered into our cultural lingo. And we ask ourselves, what do these things really mean? Two weeks ago, we began this series and we talked about speak your truth. Ever heard that one? Speak your truth or live your truth. And what we said about that is this. We said, don't speak your truth. Learn to submit to God's truth. Last week, we talked about a very, very interesting phrase. YOLO. YOLO. You only live once. And we said this. What if you don't live once? What if the point is you won't only live once? So live generously towards God. By the way, if you've missed any of those sermons, I highly recommend you to go back onto our YouTube page and check them out. They're a part of this series and will help you understand where we are going. But today, we look at the, sing the singular phrase, do what makes you happy. We look and see what are the things that are good, but where are the dangers in it? Now, the pursuit of happiness is not something which is new to us, to our generation or any other generation. In fact, in the scriptures, as far back in the Old Testament, we find a group of people on a similar pursuit of happiness. They're the Israelites, the biblical nation of Israel. Now, before they become a nation, in the book of Exodus, it chronicles their journey from slavery in Egypt. And the idea is all the ways, read the Old Testament, up to the point they actually are settled into the land that God promised for them. Now, in Exodus 3 and 8, this is what God said of them. He says this. So I have come down. This is God saying, I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh my goodness. That was God's intention to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, we may not fully appreciate the imagery of the day today when it says milk and honey. And obviously, if you're lactose intolerant, you, you would prefer if he said juice and honey or, or tea and honey or something like that. But picture, picture a land where crops grow on their own without much tending. Picture a land where mangoes are the size of watermelons. Picture a land where it's warm every day. It rains at night only. Hmm? The soil is fertile and you can drink tap water without fearing ICU or HDU. Think about a land like that. A lot of people love each other, even politicians. Even politicians love the people and give their lives for them. Roads work and fuel costs 10 shillings a liter. Can someone say hallelujah? I feel like I can stop the sermon right here. We are picturing. That what, that's what you call a happiness-inducing situation. That is where the Israelites were headed to when they left the land of Egypt. But then in Exodus 17, an interesting thing happens. Let's read together and see what happens. Exodus 17, it says this. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place 
as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but listen to this, there was no water for the people to drink. So what did they do? They quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink, Moses. And Moses replies, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, Moses, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then what does Moses do? He cries out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people, Lord? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now the Israelites had been in Egypt for hundreds of years. And they had endured a terrible, terrible captivity. And now God through his servant Moses was now leading the people out of their oppression and into the promised land. They were now on this pursuit of happiness. After years of subjugation, their dream home was on the horizon. But shock on them. God delivered them from Egypt. And in this passage, on their way, he directs them to a land with no water. Wow. Talk about someone putting a pause on your happiness. What would these guys drink? Their livestock. How would they shower? How would they make their njahe? How? Although I suspect many people are not concerned about njahe. If you don't know what njahe is, you're not from around, don't worry, you're not missing much. But talk about someone putting a pause on their happiness. Why would they want to do this? God, then God want them to experience the good things. Now, through my life, I have tried my best to erase the memories, some of the memories I have of being in a boys' boarding school, especially at times when there was no water. Now, teenage boys, at best, at best, cannot be described as clean. But now you think about putting hundreds of them in a tight space and then deprive them of water. Hey, let me tell you, I can tell you stories that will make your toes curl. And I'm trying to rid my mind of those things. But the Exodus isn't just about a couple of hundred boys waiting for Nairobi water to deliver water the next day. It's not about these people waiting and calling a water bowser and saying, please bring us some water to provide relief. No, this is over two million people in a desert. Can you imagine the sanitation issues that they had in that desert? Both men and women wanting to cleanse and purify themselves. You can imagine gusts of, of wind and, 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 and sto uh, uh, sandstorms blowing dust onto their faces and to all their clothes and all their possessions and you can't even wipe it off with some water. You can't wash it off. Just picture that. Then they, they're in a desert, hot scorching temperatures, no trees for shade and then not a drop to quench their thirst. Mouths were dry, bodies were weak. They were in need of refreshment. This was a far cry from the land of milk and honey that they were promised. So much for happiness. And you know what? They did the exact thing that I think you and I would do in a situation like that. They grumbled. They grumbled. They said to Moses, Moses, you're taking us to the land of milk and honey. Why have you brought us here? Why? Leave us in Egypt. They were really telling Moses if they had a chance, they would exit. If they had a plan B, they would go. They could not understand how a good God would bring them to a place of such unhappiness. Sound familiar? You know, we hate to admit it, but you know, this happens in our relationship with God many times. We've come to believe that God is a good God and he must only want good things for me. In fact, we even have verses that we quote. You know the verse we quote the most, Jeremiah 29, 11. We say, hey, for I know. For I know the plans that, you, you even know it off head, don't you? It's one of the verses you know off head. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future. And hallelujah, hallelujah, I feel the spirit. Psalms 85 and 12 says this, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. Amen. Can I just stop the sermon here? I just feel like we've reached our land of milk and honey. 
But does God not want good things for you? Is he some cosmic killjoy who just doesn't want us to enjoy anything? Absolutely not. In fact, God's desire for you is that you would prosper. But, but, what if, what if God's desire for you isn't just happiness? What if God's desire for you is more? Now picture with me. Imagine you had a son or a nephew, a young family member, and he goes and he plays in a local football tournament. And they, they make it all the way um, until the final. And in the final, this son or nephew of yours scores the winning goal for his team. Would you be sitting in the stands just sitting there, just watching with an angry smirk on your face? No. You'd be happy. You'd be enjoying his happiness. You'd be jumping up and down, screaming and, you know, enjoying the moment. But imagine if your son or your nephew, after scoring this goal, runs up to the opposition bench and then starts showing them obscene gestures with his fingers. Allah, how would you feel then? Would, would this young lad's happiness take a back seat? Would you now be concerned about more than just his happiness? Would you be concerned about his character and his behavior? You would realize in an instant, happiness is not supreme. Now, I suspect this is how God looked at the Israelites. God knew there was a final destination that he was taking them to. This desert they were in was not the end. And their journey towards this destination did not start from the trek from Egypt, but way back from Genesis 12. This is when the journey started. In Genesis 12, this is what God says to a man called Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And then listen to this. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, God's purpose for the people of Israel was much larger than they imagined. His intention was so good. It was to make them a great nation. It was to bless them. That's what he wanted. He wanted that all the people of the earth would be blessed through them. So as he leads them out of Egypt, God's thought is not just about lush fields. It's not just about big mangoes. It's not just, just about clean water. There's something that he wants to accomplish with them, which is much bigger than they realize themselves. What he's doing is he's preparing them for their purpose, for which he created them. He's setting them aside so they can accomplish something special. Now, I don't know if your house growing up was anything like mine. But if your house was anything like mine, we had special dishes that only came out when the VIP guests arrived. Anyone, anyone feel me? We had, we had special dishes that were kept away. There was cutlery and crockery that would only show up when the, when the most important visitors arrived. And when these things were being removed and put on the table, let me tell you, me and my siblings could not even talk loudly or breathe heavily around them. Lest by some magical thing, we, we put negative energy in the air and they get damaged. Let me tell you, we had to be completely quiet. We understood those dishes were for special purposes. In fact, there, there are some dishes my mom used to tell us growing up. She'd say, you see this one, if you break this one, just pack your bags and go. Don't even tell me. Just be on your way and go. Because these were special dishes for special use. Now, in the Hebrew language, there's a word called Kadesh. Kadesh. Kadesh meant holy. And it referred to people, places, or things that were withheld from ordinary use. They're not for ordinary, everyday use. They were treated with special care and they belonged to the sanctuary. Now, they were not holy because they had some intrinsic, you know, sanctity or sacredness about them. But it, they were holy because they belonged to God. And they were associated with him and they were being put aside for his purpose and his use. Many of these were of high value. Items of gold and silver and bronze that were made holy and put aside for his use. And we know in our worlds what precious metals go through to, to become of great value. Think about gold, for instance. Gold, for instance, comes from an ore, a rock. And it goes through a difficult process from the time it's a rock to the time it's a beautiful cup or plate, gold, gold, gold cup or plate on your table. First, toxic chemicals like cyanide, 
toxic chemicals are, are poured on this ore to break away the rock from the gold. So you can extract the metal from the ore. Then it must go through intense heat. It's like a trial by fire in a furnace. And then what this does, it changes its very form, transforming it from a solid to a liquid. Then more toxic chemicals, soda ash and borax, are poured in. And the reason for this is to purify it and remove all the impurities. Only then can it be fashioned and molded into an item of great worth. I want to suggest to you today that God wants you to be happy. Are you happy to hear that? God wants you to be happy. He wants you to have good things and enjoy a good life. But allow me today to suggest something else as well. To suggest to you that he wants more for you than just happiness. God wants more than just your happiness. He wants your holiness. Now, you say, Pastor, that's a big word. He wants my holiness. What does that mean? Does God want me walking out with a big halo and with wings saying hallelujah to every second person I meet? Does he want me with a holier-than-thou attitude where I never do anything wrong? I, I, I don't think so. I think holiness refers to the knowledge that God has set each Jesus follower apart for his special purpose. Holiness for you and I means that God knows that he has put us apart to accomplish his purpose. And as a result of that, what will he do? He will allow us a process of purification to happen in our lives so that we can become all that he intends for us to be. In fact, my one point today, if you forget everything I'm going to say to you, is this. God is not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. I'll say it again. God is not after your happiness. God is after your holiness. You see, God had set aside the biblical nation of Israel for his special purposes. That through them, the entire world would be blessed. In fact, many times he would say to them, be holy because I am holy. We see this throughout the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Be holy because I am holy. But history teaches us that they did not see this. And oftentimes were only concerned with the moment and the happiness of the moment. And if you read the story of, their, of the Israelites, their, their pursuit of happiness led to their eventual destruction. In the end, after they settled in, into their land, you know, eventually they were defeated and carried into worse exile that, than they came from in the land of Egypt. So there's a reason God invests more in your, hap in your holiness than he, than he does in your happiness. You know, it's because happiness is fleeting. It's more fleeting than we think. So the culture tells us some things. Hey, if you can have better possessions, peaceful circumstances, thrilling experiences, perfect relationships, flawless appearance, all the things we pursue, the world tells us that we would have reached our destination. That that's, that's the destination for us. If we have all the good things, but God, knowing that he has created each of us for more, doesn't settle a destination happiness. He settles a destination purpose. That's where he wants each one of us. In Peter 2.9, this is what the scriptures say. It reminds us by, by, say, by, by saying this of each one of us. But you, you are a chosen people. So you're not ordinary. You're a royal priesthood. Here's that word. You're a holy nation. What does that mean? A nation of people who have been set aside for God's purposes. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Bless God. You see, God knew the destination of the Israelites better than they did. And I want to tell you today that God knows your destination probably better than even you would imagine for yourself. And because he wants to set each one of us apart, he invests in our purification. He invests in the process. He invests in our holiness more than he does in our happiness. And I want to tell you something. This thing that culture tells us is not real. God doesn't want you to just be happy. God is not after your happiness. He's after more. He's after your holiness. And you need to know this. Holiness many times is forged in less than happy spaces. It's many times forged in the desert and in the wilderness of life. Sometimes holiness is forged in brokenness and in suffering, just like it was for the Israelites. 
And if you lay aside your pursuit of happiness, you will discover that even in the desert, even in the most difficult of situations in your life, God can provide water to help you in your journey of holiness. Why is that? It's because he wants more than your happiness. God is not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. So don't buy the lies. Don't buy the lies that the culture is telling you. It tells you that God just wants you to be happy. And it tells you that in the pursuit of happiness, you should remove the things and the people that are killing your happiness. Oh my goodness, what a lie. The culture says to you, cut toxic people out of your life. But when you study Jesus himself, what did Jesus say? Jesus, when he was asked, what's the most important commandment of all? One of the ones he gave is he said, love others the way you love yourself. In other words, expend yourself on behalf of others, toxics or otherwise. Jesus went ahead and he said, forgive your brother. How many times? 70 times 7. Listen, who knows if there are people that God has placed in your life for the purpose of your purification. And that what he's calling you to do is love even difficult people and spend your life on behalf of difficult people. And that as you do this, God will do his work in your life. Don't buy the lies that the culture is selling. The culture tells you that if you end up in a space where you don't feel happy, you need to leave. Why? Good vibes only. Good vibes only. But what if that is the very environment God, in his infinite wisdom, has brought you into so he can transform you and make you more into his own likeness? In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, a, a passage we love to quote says this. This is God reminding us, saying, listen, as I take you through situations, as I put you into places, this is what I'm saying to you, that my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are for your happiness. Mine are greater, declares the Lord. And he says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, my thoughts, says Korea, are temporal. They're designed for my happiness today. Yet I have to lean on God. I have to stop listening to that culture and say, Lord, I want to listen to you because your thoughts are for far, something far much greater than me. Listen to me, God's people. The enemy has a goal in your life. And his goal is to rob you of all the things that will be part of your purification process. The enemy wants to rob you of your patience. He wants to rob you of your perseverance. He wants to rob you of your ability to endure, your ability to love and forgive even the most difficult people. And he will sell you an empty promise called happiness and make you, make you spend your days pursuing and chasing after it. He will rob you of the pressure, the pressure that's required, that God requires to transform you into the person that he wants you to be. That's the enemy's intention for your life. And he will send you all these innocent, innocent sounding phrases and mantras and ideologies. And we begin to listen and to begin to swallow them without realizing the effect that it has on us. We begin to think happiness is the biggest thing that God has created us for. Yet today, God reminds you he's not created you for happiness. God's not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. Today, I want to tell you something as I close. Determine today that you will not be about good vibes only, but about God vibes only. Determine today that you will not be quick to cut out toxic people from your life, but you will be quick to love the same way God loved you when you yourself were broken and toxic. Determine today that if God allows you into a wilderness season, whether in a relationship, in a family, or in a workplace, your response will not be grumbling and say it's time to exit. No, you will not be grumbling and murmuring just like the Israelites did, but that you will sit long, you will sit still long enough to inquire of the Lord and ask him, what do you want to accomplish in my life? Today, I want to tell you one more time, God wants you to be happy, but he wants more than that. He wants you set apart for his purpose and he'll allow a process of purification in your life. Will you allow the Lord today to work his process in you? Will you allow him sometimes to take you into spaces and relationships that are unhappy and don't bring you the joy that you wanted, but say, Lord, I trust you because I know your destination is not destination happiness. It's destination purpose. One more time, God's not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. 
Every time your word is spoken, it has the power to go out and transform the lives of people. So now we release your word, oh God, into the hearts and minds of the men and women who are listening to this and in, uh, who are listening to this uh, broadcast today and praying, oh God, that your word will accomplish that which you have sent it out to do, oh Lord Jesus. Father, I realize and I acknowledge, oh God, even as we, even as we pray together, there are some out there who are in a difficult season. There are some out there who are in the wilderness with no water in their lives. There are some out there right now, even as they listen, even in their marriages and in their relationships, there's a sense of dryness and a sense of desertion that God has deserted them. That there are those who are listening and saying, hey, my business is crumbling. It's struggling to stay afloat. Why would God bring me to a place like this? There are others out there looking for jobs desperately and saying, oh Lord, remember me. See me as you see others. And you're wondering, why has God forsaken me? But Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us today. It reminds us today that you are still walking with us that sometimes you take us to the valley of the shadow of death, but that you are with us. Father, I pray for anyone here who's walking through that valley today. I pray for the encouragement of the Holy Spirit over them and over their lives right now in the name of Jesus, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, the Lord, that spirit of grumbling and that spirit of murmuring will be defeated today in the name of Jesus and that it will be replaced by a spirit of joy. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is about circumstance. Joy is knowing that God is in control, that your rod and your staff are with me, O oh, oh Lord. And I pray for them now, O oh God, that Lord, you would fill them even now with joy, O oh God. I pray nonetheless that you would be the one who would deliver them in your perfect time out of those difficult situations, O oh God. But even if you don't deliver them today, I pray that Lord, they would have the, the ability to wait on you and say, God is at work. I trust him. I love him. I know him and I know what he is doing and he's still at work, even though I am unhappy. So Father, I am praying, oh God, that Lord, joy would flood people's hearts even as they listen today. I pray, oh God, that Lord, the joy of the Holy Spirit would fill them today, oh God, because they would know that God is working out his purposes for each and every one of them in this season of their lives, oh God. So I commit them before you now. But Father, I want to pray as well for anybody who'd be listening to this and just say, I hear you, but I've never even given my life to Christ. I don't even have the relationship with this Christ today. Even the story you talk about, all I know is happiness. And I want this destination purpose that you speak about. I want this holiness. If you are there, you've never given your life to Christ. Or maybe you have and you've fallen away in your journey. I want you to do something with me and just really quickly, just say this prayer with me. Repeat it after me and everyone listening can repeat it after me as well. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Say it out loud. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word today. I realize that I am far away from you and that my life is full of brokenness and emptiness and, and that I've been pursuing after happiness. But today I want to pursue after you. And I want you to make me whole. So today, I make the decision to invite you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. I accept you now into my life, into my heart, and into my mind. I am now your son or your daughter in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for everyone who has prayed this prayer. And I pray the Lord you would secure your word, you would secure your seed in their hearts and in their lives and you would walk with them to grow them in their journey of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh wow, what a wonderful time that we've had today. And I want to encourage you, if you're one of those who's made a prayer today and made a decision, I want you to go into the chat and just indicate it. I want you to DM us, to inbox us and just say, I'm one of those who's made a decision to follow Christ. Remember God's people, God loves you, but he's not after your happiness, he's after Hey, for all of those who are watching from the different uh, uh, viewing centers, there are going to be questions up on the screen for you to look at and just internalize and just have a conversation around. But for anybody else who's there, please take a look at these questions. Take a notebook, a diary, write them out and just say, this is what I'm hearing from God's word. So we leave them up on the screen. But until next week, when we bring this series into week four, I pray may the Lord bless you. May he be, may he, may he be with you and may he grant you a great, great week. We'll see you here next week, same time. God bless.